Hello, and welcome to Outdoor Explorer Presents Foraging with Chef John Ferris. John, a Marin County chef and founder of Indigenous Edibles, is a lecturer, cooking instructor, native plant specialist, and food educator. He has been cooking with ingredients native to the Americas for over 10 years. Uh, we'll be listening to John's presentation, and then we'll have time for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, please be sure to put your questions into the Q&A box. You can find that um, along your toolbar here on Zoom. Um, we prefer that to putting them into the chat so that we can see them all and get as many of them organized and answered as possible. Um, a recording of tonight's presentation will be available um, probably tomorrow on the Contra Costa County Library's YouTube page. Um, I'll post the link to the channel in the chat so you can access it, and I'll also email that to the registrants. Um, thank you for being here, and please welcome Chef John. Hi, thanks for all coming tonight. I'm really excited about being able to show you a little bit of the wildlife that's out there in California. Uh, right now, as uh, as the little uh, the uh, startup page here has is elderberry season. Those are elderberries, and uh, they are kind of an agrarian type of uh, a fruit that grows on trees out uh, out around Northern California. So, uh, and right now they just went from blossoming in, or uh, well, from blooming the flowers into the uh, berries, which you see right here. And uh, one thing, one note about elderberries is that they are slowly in decline because the weather's drying up and they uh, have been partners with the oaks and the bays and the manzanitas now for quite a long time. And it's drying up for them and they need a little bit more water that has been uh, uh, than they've been getting in the past. So anyway, let's get started. Um, so. Okay, my thing is not working here. <laughs> Hold on. Let's see what's, what's going on. Why is that not working? Holy cow. All right. Hold on. Pay attention here, John. Let's see if we can get this going. There we go. Okay. All right. So we're going to take a little look about the common weeds to forage in the city, uh, in the urban settings, and also in the backyard and in the wild. But first, let's. I wanted to make a uh, a memorial to the. Uh, I wanted to recognize the uh, unceded unceded land of the Coast Miwok, which is the land that I am on here in Petaluma. Uh, this is a picture of a tribute to Zupi, the last Native American woman who left all any information of Petaluma and her uh, Miwok life, she let, she was the last lady to be recorded about the historic coast Miwoks. This is part of their dance. They are part of the Southern Sonoma uh, tribes. Coast Miwoks were all through uh, San Francisco, up well, up through Marin, little part of San Francisco, that was Ohlone's there, and then uh, crossing the bridge, which is now a bridge, uh, was the Coast Miwoks. And they go up in through, uh, wow, up through Southern Sonoma, up into Northern Sonoma. So this is kind of an idea of what uh, what they had in prehistoric times. So I wanted to ask if you know what land that you are on. It's always a good thing to to pay tribute to to who became, who came before you. So that is a... Uh, an appreciation of life that was before us that actually made possible about what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to be talking about foraging. Uh, and here's some suggested equipment needed in order to forage. I'll start with this. We got the field guide and a little trowel. You know, tr pe most people know the garden trowels or a hori hori. I have the hori hori down here at the bottom. You may not, uh, if you may not know what it is, it's a Japanese uh, weeding knife actually. And it has a serrated edge on one side. Those are really good for digging up uh, roots. And then your gloves are always recommended, a pruning knife and shears. 
fabric basket or bags as opposed to like plastic bags. Fabric bags help keep the um, the items breathing. And it also, if they drop spores, we want to be able to have them propagate uh, in, back into the wild and the spores can get through the fabric baskets. And of course, think about proper clothing and shoes. And uh, it would be like hiking shoes. Proper clothing would be uh, on most days would probably be long, long, uh, uh, long pants, hiking pants. Uh, and so here is a, a good picture of everything that might be needed. So why forage? It's plentiful, free, available to everyone. Can lower grocery costs. That would happen if you do a lot of foraging. There's less waste. Wild foods have a higher nutritional value. I don't know if you know that. And it was fun to find that out because it kind of makes it a little more interesting and uh, certainly a lot more fun to know that you're uh, keeping up with your health by foraging wild plants. They spend their livelihood in, uh, oops, uh, let me go back again. Spend their livelihood growing deeper into the soil to extract the nutrients. That's why they have a higher nutritional value. So here's a couple of foraging rules. This is all for uh, the beginners. Some of you that may be foraging uh, uh, journeymen out there, uh, there may be something new for you, and you probably already know this. But I imagine most people tonight uh, really want to have some information about foraging, and that's what this is all about tonight. So. If you happen to be on a private property, do ask for permission. Find out who you can ask about even uh, taking apples off of, uh, in somebody's yard. You know, more than likely, most people that I've ever encountered that are that are willing to let go of their fruit hardly ever pick it themselves anyway. And giving them a couple of a couple of baskets or a couple of bagfuls of their fruit would be a, a good tribute to their generosity. Learn from the experts. If you're a little shy about going out there by yourself, uh, take somebody that's already been there before and can give you an idea about uh, what to look for. And because there are some lookalikes out there that you might want to uh, be concerned about. And we'll go through a little bit of that. And use a field guide and read books on foraging. Now, at the end here, I do have some books that uh, you can take a picture of. They're just piled up uh, on a slide. And you can take a picture of the books that I would recommend that are very good uh, books, very basic and easily understood. And the, the best part is that they have colored pictures. Um, I know a lot of foraging books that I picked up early on had a lot of drawings and most of them are not helpful other than like maybe some plants have a, a very distinguished type of look. You, it might be easy that way, but for the most part, most of the uh, drawings were not really, eh, you know, they were kind of, uh, they were good, but they're not good enough. They don't get as good as colored pictures. And of course, don't eat a plant you haven't properly identified and you wouldn't risk your life on. And, and that's an important, that one is always probably the most important rule is if you don't know what it is, don't eat it. Only harvest what you will use. And that's, probably less than you may think. And then mindfully harvest no more than 10% of plants that may not be very abundant in an area. And they may even be at endangered species. So you don't wanna really take endangered species. So you would take uh, a lot less than you might expect from an area that is, is not propagated with a lot of plants. So, and never take the last plant in an area. And harvest so that you would know that uh, no one would know where you've been. That's always a good a good thing. Uh, even on Mount Everest, now I understand that they're they're picking up tons of garbage from so many expeditions up there, and it could happen also in foraging too. So be mindful about uh, you know Mother Nature and the beauty and the pristine life that she has given us in order to be able to forage. Never harvest when someone has sprayed chemicals, places that are commonly sprayed or have high pollution. Railroad tracks, under power lines, busy roadsides, city parks. In fact, today I was going to 
picked some elderberries and they were right next to a telephone pole. And I realized I can't do that because they spray around the telephone pole and under the wire. So, of course, the, the fruits, any kind of wildlife would pick up on that. So you were, here are areas you were advised not to forage in, old orchards, busy roads, train tracks, conventional farm fields where pesticide drift is likely, near old and new factories, near landfills, in plain in foot floodplains downstream from old chemical companies, and under power lines. So those are good. Those are good ideas uh, about where not to uh, forage, and of course you must always think about this too. Uh, nature's uh, nature's gift to uh, the dog. <laughs> so you also may want to think about not uh, foraging too low, <laughs> especially like blackberries or something that's like coming right up out of the ground, because this is a reality. It's kind of funny. That's a little bit of comic relief there. And so here's some of the do's. Do check your backyard, your garden, empty lots first before going on hikes for edible weeds. Because you'd be surprised what uh, you would find. After today, you should be able to identify a lot more items in your backyard that you might want to try and, and uh, eat and cook. And we're going to go over a little bit of that today, too. So engage your senses. Look at your surroundings. Are you in the middle of a forest? Where are you? You know, are you able to um, uh, feel free about foraging in the woods? You know, maybe up on a hill where there's not a lot of traffic, of human traffic. Uh, animals are always going to be there. So look at your surroundings and decide on whether you think it might be good to um, forage there. Mostly open Open woods is usually pretty good. Touch the plant for any telltale irritants like hairs, sap. Most white sap is means that it's not really good eating. It may be toxic, but it may not, but it probably won't be good eating. And smell before eating. Crush the leaf for odor. Putrid doesn't, you don't eat it. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, very... Uh, aromatic leaves out there, like the uh, California bay leaf. If you were to take a bay leaf, they're all over the place. Uh, they grow uh, pretty much next to the acorns and manzanitas and uh, madrone trees. Bay trees are, are as old as, as oaks, and they are amazing. And if you were to pick one of those leaves, you would you could split it in half and take a smell on it. And it's a very aromatic. And the Native Americans used that leaf to stick up their nose when they had a headache. So it's, it's also very medicinal. And then listen, are there cars nearby, dogs? Do you hear acorns dropping? You're probably in a good area if you do. Or if you crush them under your feet, that's a good place. If you're crushing acorns under your feet, I would be looking up. <laughs> Taste a little piece on your tongue. Any reaction? If you get a reaction, you probably you don't want to uh, uh, cook, uh, eat it. All right, uh, let's see, did I miss it again? Yeah, here we did, okay. All right, so let's go to the urban and backyard foraging, like I mentioned first. This is a fairly common one, mostly grows in the shade. It's called miner's lettuce. This is, a, it's called miner's lettuce because this is what the gold miners ate when they first discovered gold around Sutter's Mills. And it just, the name stuck. Yeah, it, almost every part of this plant is edible. The flowers, which kind of poke up through the center, and then the leaves, of course. And you would want to eat miner's lettuce raw. Uh, Sautéing it would just kind of destroy it. So it is kind of a somewhat of a succulent. And so it's really good raw. Put it into a salad. That is, uh, that is good eating. And then this is pineapple wheat. It looks very similar to uh, chamomile. The flowers are quite a little bit different, but as you can see, they have a little bud that comes up to up to a little point. And if you were to sniff that, it has a very uh, aromatic uh, reminder of pineapple. And then, of course, these are the chamomiles, which you can dry and uh, create tea. 
purslane. Purslane is a weed that grows up in through the sidewalks and in through actually what chamomile and pineapple weed also grow up through the through the uh, sidewalks. And then this is purslane. It's a succulent. Uh, this is what I want to grow in my garden because this is really good. This is another plant that you would want to pick the leaves and eat uh, fresh. Uh, I don't. I haven't tried it yet, baking it or sautéing it or anything, but it is really good, uh, fresh. Just pick off a leaf and and try it. Uh, again, be be cognizant of the ground that you're taking it from, and also what's around there if it's been sprayed or something to that effect. That's true with all of these wild with the wild edibles, dandelions. Everybody must know about dandelions. Um, they are all parts of edible. Uh, the leaves are sour, they're bitter, uh, which also makes for nice medicine. And the little flower heads can actually be dumped into batter and create a fritter with them. Or you can eat those, uh, you can eat those raw. And also the roots of the dandelion you can dry and make coffee with. This is lamb's quarters. You'll see these out there a lot. This is part of the chenopodium family, which is part of the of the quinoa family. And uh, they grow wild. And this is actually very good eating. And this is also something else that I want to grow in my garden, lamb's quarters. So I'm hoping to create a new kind of salad with all of these wild greens that are, are good raw. Also daylilies. I don't know if you see these flowers around. The flower buds, if you look into the picture, you could see the buds there in the back. And the leaves are edible. And also the, uh, I believe it also the root, the bulb. Wood sorrel, you see a lot of this. They they grow in the shade mostly, and it, it picks up that little it uh, a little uh, yellow flower pokes up through there in the, in the summer, and that's also very edible and can be eaten. And I know my daughter would come home with uh, one of those in her teeth, and uh, I think what I forgot what she called it a sour sour flower or something to that effect. And uh, it's, if you enjoy sour, it's a good taste to, uh, uh, it's a good uh, way to taste the wild in all of its various forms. Because also sour is good. It's also a, um, a deterrent in nature for other predators to stay away from the plant. Sourness is, bitterness is, a lot of plants that are toxic or that are uh, not edible is a is a protection mechanism. Broadleaf plantain, you probably see this everywhere. Those little buds sticking up, the seed pods are edible. You could dry those, toast them, or you can just saute them in uh, in butter, a little bit of oil perhaps. Even the the leaves. Now there's two there's two plantains. There's the broadleaf, and then there is the thin leaf, which I don't have a picture of, but it has the same kind of seed heads. And you'll recognize it as a plantain because of those seed pods. And uh, the flowers are very thin and lancelet-like for the uh, thin plantain. This is chicory. The, the uh, root is good for the flower. You've heard, I'm sure you've heard about chicory. The flowers, I think, are also edible. Common mallow. I've got tons of... Uh, mallow out here. I live on a farm in uh, Petaluma in a little studio and we've got nothing but mallow growing wild everywhere. It's uh, I've, I've got a couple of gardens growing and I'm trying to keep the mallow out and I figured okay well we'll just let it grow and, and eat it. So the flowers and the leaves are edible. It has a mucilogenic uh, type of uh, texture to it so it's kind of like okra when you cook it it gets a little bit you know mucilogenic um, so that's that's another protectivism for the mal uh, for the mallow. Clover. This, this happens to be red clover. You could eat the clover tops if you want raw, and also the uh, the leaves. But you can dry them and make a little bit of a flower out of it. That's what the Native Americans did. They made flour wherever they could, and it actually extends the life of a plant when it goes out of season. You'll be able to eat something in the winter that grew only in the summer because you made flour out of it. All right, and this is sow thistle. You see sow thistle um, is uh, uh, everywhere also. This is an early stage of the sow thistle where the leaves are very, uh, very edible. 
So you could see it has a very, very particular type of leaf shape. So that is something that uh, is very distinguishable about the south thistle. Plus also the, uh, the flower, the flower looks very similar to uh, dandelion, but it's on a very thin uh, elongated stem. And as you can see, there's a bud there that kind of looks like a bell. That's also a very distinguishing trademark or a landmark for the, uh, the south thistle. That's all edible. These are the prickly pears. You'll see these a, a lot everywhere. The uh, the leaf, which is called the nopal, and also the fruit, which is called the tuna, are also very edible. Uh, with the uh, with the tuna or any part of the cactus, actually, you want to be able to uh, be very careful. Wear gloves and use tongs to kind of twist those off the leaf. And then what you would do if you want to get inside and eat the fruit, which I highly recommend, is uh, take that tuna, that little red fruit there, and put it over a gas fire. Uh, and the fire will burn off the little glow sticks. And then it's a lot easier to handle. But <laughs> really, there's no guarantee because those little glow sticks uh, can still get, get into your fingers. And they're they're tinier than hairs and they just once they're in your skin they're very uh very tough to get out you have to kind of wait until you until they just uh fall off themselves and then after you have burned off the uh, the glochids then you make a little slice through the skin and you just kind of roll it off with your knife and inside you'll get the tuna the fruit which is actually kind of like a watermelon in this case with the color of the tuna, but it has a lot of seeds. So you might want to either, uh, you will you can eat it that way, but uh, what, what the best use for it is to sieve it, sieve it through a, uh, well, a sieve. And uh, so the, you get just the nectar and then you can toss the seeds or dry the seeds and grow back more prickly pear cactus. This is chickweed, you'll see a lot of this. It's almost like a little vine with white flowers. Those are all very edible. Now there's another lookalike that's uh, very similar. It's called a pimpernel and, and it has like kind of orange pink flowers. And that's a little bit sour. So the chickweed has the white flowers. Those are the ones that you want to eat. Those are, those are a lot easier to eat. Stinging nettles. Uh, anybody that's come across stinging nettles will know why it's called stinging nettles. It's a formic acid that uh, is on the little hairs of the nettles. And uh, if you could pick it down below, take it home and wear gloves and uh, put that into some uh, water, you can, you can blanch it for just a few seconds and it's neutralized. So the, the formic acid is no more and it won't be, it won't be uh, stinging anymore. And I've made uh, nettles pesto out of this soup and also uh, gnocchi. I mix it in with some uh, flour and I create a, a green gnocchi with uh, nettles. Very good. And then this is yellow dock. You, you probably see this everywhere. You can identify it uh, mostly by the, uh, the seed head there. And the, the seeds are edible when they are dry. Now, if you take a look at the leaves, you could see that the leaves have a little bit of a, have a wavy edge to them. That's also another significant identifying factor of the yellow dock. And this is what this is the uh, stage where the seeds are edible, uh, and they're also very good to like put on top of foods and stuff. So you might want to try wait until it gets to this point, or if you want to take a fresh one, go ahead and let them dry. Hang them up upside down and let them dry. And when they get to this point. Then you can eat them that way, mix them up. You can grind them and add them into food or uh, 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 eat, them, eat them like this. Or eat them, or, or you can take them off whole and throw, just put them on top of food as a garnish. And like I was mentioning earlier, uh, all of these wild foods are highly nutritious. So you can almost call them superfoods, but it's, it's identifying them and uh, knowing what they are that really helps in uh, getting what you can out of these. And then this is uh, burdock. You probably have seen this. They usually grows around um, little creeks. Sometimes you'll see it in fields too. And it's, it's very similar 
to uh, dock, except the leaves are a lot wider. As you can see, they're almost like heart shaped, but they have that wavy edge to them. So, and they're, they're a much bigger plant as far as the leaves go and their potential to get, to get really huge. This is mustard. You probably have seen this all over the place. You go to Napa and you'll see a lot of this in between the grapevines. That's also very edible. The leaves are very mustardy along with the flower heads, which are not, which are mustardy, but not quite as pungent as the leaves. And then this is wild radish. This comes in various colors. You'll see reds, you'll see whites. And there may be a blue out there a little bit too. So the flowers are also very edible. Uh, like the mustard, they're not quite as pungent as the leaves. So if you want a salad that has a little bit of a, a bite to it, the uh, radish leaves are uh, best for that. Now you wanna get any of these leaves that you can eat raw. You wanna get them as young as possible because that's when they are at their best. This is bull thistle. If you wanted to go through all the trouble of uh, stripping it of all of its uh, pricklies and, and the, the uh, skin, the, uh, the little green parts down near towards the uh, stem, that's all very edible, believe it or not. So the leaves, the seeds, the stems, the flower, they're all edible. You just have to watch not getting stung. So it takes a, it takes a lot of effort and uh, it may not be worth it to, to some people. This is milk thistle. This is also coming in, but, it, uh, but it's also very edible at a young stage. As you'll notice, as the picture shows, it has uh, uh, thorns or pricklies at the end. Now, if you get the milk thistle young enough to where, you know, baby thistle, basically, the pricklies do, do have a little bit of a sting, but they are neutralized in hot water. Um, I would, uh, I would tr try one first. I would put, if you wanted to try milk thistle, I would get a, get a handful, put a leaf into boiling water, give it a few seconds, pull it out, and, and try it. And then uh, I believe that you'll find that it's very, uh, very tasty, actually, and that the little pricklies are so small enough that they're now rendered harmless. So this is, now we're going to go into the backyard. This is actually something I did from my backyard. As you can see, let's see, what do we got here? We got nasturtiums, we got carrots, we got dill, we got uh, fennel. Also uh, dandelions, and I think there might be some thyme in there. And we actually made a little bit of a salad. I was uh, doing a little video for a, uh, a group, and they wanted to actually cook some up. So that's what we did. And nasturtiums, you'll find these just about everywhere. I don't know if you know or not, but the leaves and the flowers are both edible. Now, since they are everywhere, you want to be careful where you pick them from because some people spray their, their gardens, some people spray on the streets. Where You have to be aware, part of being able to forage well is to understand your environment and know what, know what, what could be, know the possibilities of, of why you may be able to pick it and why you may not. So the, the uh, nasturtium is very peppery just like watercress, which is also another wild, a wild plant, uh, the, along with the, the flowers. The flowers aren't as peppery as the leaves, but it makes an excellent uh, pop in your mouth for a salad. All right, so now we're gonna go into the wild. This is what I've, which is what I've uh, captured in the wild. Those are uh, shelled acorns, and also in the back there are, are madrone berries. Now this is Queen Anne's lace. Now, Queen Anne's lace, you'll see everywhere, very thin, uh, very thin stems along with, with hair, if you want to call it that, on the stems. Now, the, there's also a very deadly lookalike, but I'm going to show you now the signature uh, uh, landmark for the uh, Queen Anne's lace. And that's this little piece in the middle here. This is part of the flower. Right in the middle, you'll see there's a little, well, it's, it's a kind of a little middle and it's part of the flower base. So all Queen Anne's laces have those, you'll see those. Uh, that's how you know it's a Queen Anne's lace along with the long stem, there's a little hair on it, they're everywhere. And mostly they're along the roads. So you can, you can dig these up 
and you get the little carrot, like it's actually part of the carrot family. It is wild, of course, and do pay attention to where you are getting it from because most of these are along the road and I wouldn't advise uh, uh, picking those along the road as we talked about before. So here is the lookalike that I was talking about. It's called water hemlock. The, the flowers are very similar in formation, but they are different, but they look uh, similar enough to where you might get confused. But the signifying thing of, of difference between the water hemlock and the Queen Anne's lace is the stem. You could see the stem is rather large and it has these purple reddish dots on them. And that signifies that it is a water hemlock. Every part of the water hemlock is toxic. Don't even mess with it. Cut it down if you see it, but cut it down with a... Uh, could have done with a machete. Now, this was what killed Aristotle. I think it was Aristotle that drank hemlock. And the story goes that those dots, the purple dots, the bloody red dots on there is his blood. <laughs> it's a nice little uh, tale to tell everybody. And so here we go with um, some more foraging. Now, going from the left to the right, we've got this is acorn flower. I make my own acorn. I'm sorry. This is mesquite flower. And mesquite, we'll go over the mesquite as we get there. And then also to the top there in the middle is acorn flower, then black walnuts. And then uh, this is cattail pollen. So we're going to explore each one of those plants. And first up is the cattail pollen. Or, well, cattail. Now, all parts of the cattail are, well, I shouldn't say all parts, but the inner stem and the actual end end is also very edible only when it's green. And you can almost eat it like corn. In the center picture there, you see you see that little green top. That is, that's in an edible form. It's probably best to boil that maybe with a little bit of water. And then you can see how it's broken down uh, the stem into the top center there is what the stems, it's kind of celery-like and it's very edible. Also, the roots can also be uh, uh, also be edible. You wanna dry those out and they, they cook up kind of like potatoes. This is sumac. They don't see a lot of sumac around, but it's very distinguishable. The berries are sour. The berries are the red little uh, gatherings there at the top and uh, they have this lemony sour taste to them and they're they're great for lemonade. And then as, as you see here, we've already gone over this, but on the right, we got acorn flower, the black walnuts, and the black walnut trees are all over Northern California and also ro uh, rose hips. Rose hips, of course, are very good for tea. And you, uh, but they're full of seeds. You wanna open them up and get those seeds out, dry them, and you can make tea out of that. Now, we, I talked earlier about bay nuts. These are the bay nuts as they are ready to be picked. And they drop to the ground kind of looking like this. So that outer skin is very pliable, very, uh, 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 well, very pliable. And it it's easily comes off with your fingers. And in the middle, you'll find the nuts. And these nuts here, they're kind of like, uh, they almost look like hazelnuts. But here I uh, roasted them in an oven at about 350 degrees and they get uh, they get black and they almost look like coffee beans at that point. And you can so you can actually grind it, put it in with some coffee and have a nice cup of joe if you like. But also, too, what happens because of their high in uh, oils, they you get a little bit of a buzz for about five minutes. It's a very clean buzz but it's very distinguishable. So add a little bit of that after you roast them into your coffee and you'll get that. Also the Native Americans would crush these up after they roasted them and it was almost very chocolate-like. They would put it into different foods. Here's the madrone berries. You saw those earlier. Those grow, like I mentioned earlier, along with uh, uh, oaks and uh, manzanitas and bay trees. Here's the, here's the berries. They have kind of a sweet taste to them, but like most uh, wild uh, fruits, 
uh, they are uh, they have there are a lot of seeds because they're made to propagate in the wild. They're not necessarily good for eating like we get fruit in the uh, in the supermarkets. This is mesquite, mesquite pods. Uh, these these pods grow on the mesquite tree. It's a hot weather tree there and they are considered legumes. So they are very good to eat and they can also give nitrogen to the ground. You let the, you take the, uh, you take the uh, pods from the tree, let them dry and then you crush them and you get mesquite flour and it's actually very sweet. So it's really interesting to know uh, with the mesquite, you won't find a lot of them here. They're mostly down in Southern uh, California. I found a lot of them around Death Valley. I was over on the Shoshone property and they were starting to recultivate their, their mesquite trees. Those are, those were domesticated. I shouldn't say domesticated, but they were cultured by the Shoshone Indians there down in Death Valley. And that's used as a flower and it can also be used as a spice. So here's a little bit of an acorn process that I was gonna show you. I shell them, I put them into water. The water turns brown and you just change the water and until the water becomes clear. And once it's clear, they're free of the, uh, the tannic acids. And then once they're at that point, they're actually kind of sweet. You can taste one raw like that. And uh, they're actually kind of sweet. So once they're uh, leached of the tannic acid, I put them into a, a grinder, add a little bit of water, and then I spread them out on a, a dehydrator sheet. And then after, uh, after processing, this is kind of like what you get. You can put that into also a low, a low temperature oven and let it dry out. You want to make sure that it's totally dry out because it can mold. If you let it, uh, if you pull it out and there's still parts of it that are moist, you want it totally dry. Then you can run it through a uh, processor or a coffee grinder. You get a finer grind with a coffee grinder. What I used was a uh, juicer. I don't know if I have that. No. Uh, I used a uh, worm driven Omega juicer, which has a very slow worm drive that goes horizontally. So it's very slow, very powerful, and I have a little attachment that I could mill on. And so that's how I got my acorn flour. And with acorn flour, I mix it with a little bit of regular flour, and I add a little bit of uh, ricotta cheese, and I get a nice soft pillowy type of uh, dumpling, uh, which I love to make create new shapes with. You can also make acorn bread. Now, basically, you can, you can adapt bread recipes and add acorn flour. Acorn flour is non-gluten, so you would need to add it with uh, white flour if you wanted to get uh, the solid material like you would for a bread. Also with the dumplings, I created a, a bison stew. I dried some green beans, put it all in there, rehydrated it, it looks pretty good. All right, and back to the wild. We got cleavers. These are pretty distinctive. You find these in, in, in uh, uh, in the understory of redwoods and other uh, woods in Northern California. Now, the thing about the cleavers, why they're called cleavers, is because they, uh, they're like Velcro. You can put them in, on your shirt, of course, as you see here, and they will stick. So you don't really want to eat them raw. You want to do a quick saute on them, and that will uh, mitigate the... the, the uh, um, the stickies, the little cleavers. And yeah, right, these are toyon berries. They're called uh, they're called Christmas berries because they they start becoming ripe around Christmas. Now, uh, they're of course they're all seeds, very little meat, a little bit on the sour side. But these are really good for making a sauce. And you want to strain out the seeds, and you get a nice red sauce. And then with that sauce, you can do anything you want. You can add uh, flavorings to it. You can add syrup uh, or sugar and, and make a syrup out of it. These are thimble berries. I found these around, um, where was it? Muir Beach. Muir Beach, if you take a particular uh, path through the woods there, you, you, there's lots of thimble berries. These are Himalayan blackberries. Of course, as you know, they're all over Northern California. These, uh, this berry is, uh, was by, uh, actually, it was created by uh, Luther Burbank. 
and we have him to thank for them being everywhere. But the berries are wonderful. And we got the manzanita berries. And uh, manzanita, of course, is a Spanish word, which means little apple. And as you can see there, they look like little apples. There's a lot of seeds in those also. Uh, what I like to do with the berries is to take them home, let them dry, and crush them. And they're actually really sweet. And you can make a nice sea, uh, cider out of that. And that's what the Native, Native uh, Americans did with manzanita berries. And then, of course, this is wild strawberries. They're actually very small and kind of sour. But I think this is the stock that they use to grow modern-day strawberries. Elderflower, uh, uh, elderflowers. This is part of the elderberries. Now the flower is, this is what you'll see before you find the elderberries. So when you're right in the middle of summer, when you're going down the road, I'm always looking for these elderberry trees and you can always spot them because of these flowers. You can take these flowers and you can make uh, uh, elderflower uh, a cocktail with them. And also you can dip them in batter and also, and make uh, fritters. They're very good that way. These are the elder, elderberries. They're in season right now. And that's what they turn into from the flowers. These are also not edible, not advised to eat raw, but you would uh, drop them into a pan with hardly any water, put it on a low heat and just let them, let them cook. And you, after a while, you get eh, 20 minutes, half an hour, you get a liquid. And then you strain everything out and you got this nice elderberry juice, which of course would be kind of sour, but it's ready to do anything you want with. Here's wild hazelnuts. I've seen those in Marin. This is fact, fact where I took the uh, picture from. Now conifers are also, I don't want to say edible, but they are, they make a very nice tea. The long, the long uh, needles that you see here is signature for a pine tree. But almost any conifer tree, except the yew, a yew tree, which I don't think we have a lot of around here, maybe Southern California. Uh, but most conifers are can be used for tea. You want to put those in hot boiling water and simmer it for about uh, seven to eight minutes, 12 minutes, somewhere in there to uh, get get a nice, nice tea out of it. Here's the manzanita tree. I, I took a picture of this because the wood is so beautiful. And this is madrone, uh, also again, very luminescent brown and the bark peels off of the madrone. Now we're on the mushrooms and we're gonna talk about poisonous mushrooms and a little bit of guidelines on that. So here, avoid mushrooms with white gills, a skirt or a ring on the stem and a bulbous sac, which is called a vulva. You may be missing out on some good edible fungies, but it means you're avoiding the deadly members of the Amanita family. And the red one, of course, was the Amanita. And also the uh, that was the death angel on the right there. On the right is the death angel. So there's the little vulva that we're talking about at the bottom. This part here. And then it looks beautiful, but it's poisonous. Don't eat. Avoid mushrooms with red tops. Again, you'll be missing out on some good mushrooms, but more importantly, you won't be picking poisonous ones. And the most important rule is don't eat any mushrooms unless you're 100% sure of what, what they are. So here's the bolites. This is uh, the porcini. You'll find these are kind of distinguishable because it has a very fat stem to it. And it doesn't have gills, as you notice underneath the heads there. This is another sign of a poisonous mushroom when you get a blue coloring. Uh, I actually have seen that. I don't see that too often but you do see occasionally with the blue. So you know that's poisonous. Here's a good oyster mushroom you'll see growing on dead trees. Here's the blonde morel and other, and the black morel, which you'll see. Now these need a really good cleaning because there's insects and stuff that grow inside all of those little, uh, all of those little holes. That's their little, little housing area there. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the caves of Cappadocia. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with Cappadocia. There was a lot of underground uh, uh, dwellings inside a rock. And it just looks kind of almost looks like a, a morel. So inside there, you want to pay attention about cleaning those. And morels come up after the fires in the Sierras. The, the, the ground is freshly 
burnt and it uh, and the ash creates a new nutrients for the mushrooms to come up. Turkey tail, you see that a lot. You see that a lot on dead wood. Uh, you also want to cook that. That's also a very medicinal mushroom. Chanterelles, this is a picture that I took. Uh, I actually had found these and man, there is nothing more more satisfying than seeing that golden mushroom come up through the wild like that. And this is a false chanterelle. If you want to take a look at that, you could see uh, the difference in the chanterelles and the false mushrooms, which is called a, a jack-o'-lantern. This is the same mushroom at a different angle so that you can kind of see. And this is another look at how they may look in the wild. And the shaggy parasols are also very edible. Chicken of the woods, very edible. Very beautiful too, actually. These are all things, all fungi that you want to, to saute. It's advisable to uh, saute almost any of the edible mushrooms because they, they come out much better. And the thing about mushrooming, I'm not a I'm not a mycologist, so I only I think probably one good thing about uh, foraging for mushrooms is is only pick what you know, what you're 100 percent sure of mushrooms that you know. And there's only a couple that I know, like the oyster mushroom, the chanterelle, uh, morels. I've never seen any morels, but that would be highly identifiable. And let's see, and, and turkey tail you could take and and bring home and uh, saute or dry it out and turn it into a powder and create medicine. Here's the shaggy manes. Those are also uh, very edible. Now here's the books that I would recommend for uh, learning, learning to identify and just getting some good ideas about foraging. I would suggest that you take your camera and take a picture of this. So I'll give you another minute or so and uh, you can take a picture, understand, or, or see some of the names of the authors. Samuel Thayer, uh, he's gotten, he's got at least three books there. Zakos, Backyard Foraging and Wildcraft Cocktails. It's also another uh, uh, famous uh, forager, along with uh, Pascal Baldar at the bottom there, and then Steve Brill which is the edible and medicinal plants. They call him Wild Man Steve. He was one of the earlier uh, foragers that created a book and kind of uh, set up the industry of foraging. So we're just about done here. And here's all of my information. I would love to be able to be in contact with you. So there's my website, which is www.indigenousedibles.com. Uh, my email, please give me an email if you have any questions. Uh, we'll be taking questions here momentarily. So uh, uh, if you have something else that you want to talk about, do give me a, a, a buzz with uh, email or you got my phone number there. John Ferris, um, Indigenous Edibles, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Um, we're going to get a couple uh, questions answered from the Q and A here. Okay. First question uh, was about um, I think at the beginning you were talking about places not to forage. Question is what is brownfield? <laughs> I avoided that because I'm not sure. I never looked it up, but I I, uh, I believe it. It's uh, no, I, I don't know actually. I'd have to look that up. Well, avoid it either way. Homework. I didn't do my homework. Next question, um, is purslane the same plant commonly used in landscaping or are the large swaths on hills another type of succulent? Uh, it, is sure. a ground, it is a ground cover, so it may be used in uh, landscaping, but it is very invasive. So more than likely, it's better to just pick it and eat it or let it grow if you got if you're in a in your if you're in a field, uh, let it grow or come back and pick it. But it is very invasive, but it is also very uh, nutritious. Okay. Um, when can you harvest nettles? Harvest nettles. Um, let's see. They are harvestable now. 
in the fall and in the summer too. They're 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 a perennial, so they're around most of the years. Uh, you want to get smaller. Now you're going to find them by creeks. That's where I find them in. Uh, let me stop sharing here. I was trying to get the old screen, but that's gone. So you you can uh, you can pick nettles almost all year. They are a perennial. You'll find them near creeks. And uh, as they get older, they get bigger and they get a little bit more um, chewier. So you want to get the young leaves and always make sure that you're using gloves and a little bit of a pruning shears or something to cut them off. Take them home in a bag or in a uh, fabric basket and uh, put them in blanched water for about a minute. And they're perfectly good. They're actually higher in vitamin C and more nutritious than spinach. Oh, all right. Um, someone commented, and I wondered if you wanted to add anything. They said there's no collection on federal, state, or regional parks. Right. Yes. Uh, so that's kind of like what's making, uh, besides climate change, that's that's the other part that's making uh, making it hard to just go out and forage. Part of the, uh, I had mentioned earlier. Probably what's going to be happening now is either getting in contact with somebody that has land and ask them for permission, which will probably be a very big, uh, big thing in the future is asking permission. But also, uh, it's a good time to check in the fields around your house in the neighborhoods. I mean, foraging is also picking apples, you know, you might want to look around for in, in my area, I know I lived in San Rafael, there was uh, wild plum plum trees. Wild plums are very small and they were right off the grounds of the school. And we just had a hell of a time picking uh, wild plums. So, and you can make a nice sauce out of that. So it is getting harder, but it is, we just have to get a little bit more savvy about where we go. Oh, thank you. All right, next question um, is about allergies with acorn. Um, and I will say, always speak to a medical provider about that, but I wondered if you had any comments on acorns and allergies. I have not heard that. The acorn is a nut. I mean, it's considered a nut, at least for people that are, it's, uh, I guess it's a nut, yeah. I was gonna say it's a seed, but it's not really a seed. Uh, but I, yeah, I would contact your doctor about that. Now, there may be a difference between eating it or, or being allergic to it when it's unleached and when it's leached. I mean, more than likely, you're not going to eat an unleached acorn anyway. Uh, but I would check on that. Uh, uh, I, I, I've never heard of anybody having an allergy to acorns. Of course, it's not a mainstream food. So, uh, right now, you know, that could be something that needs to be explored if more people get into uh, making acorns or uh, making uh, acorn products from flour. That's what I would like. That's where I can be of help to anybody. If you come across a lot of acorns, give me a call and I'll, I'll go through all the whole process with you of making acorn flour. It's really exciting and it's very nutritious, actually. Like I mentioned, most wild foods are very nutritious. It is a process. It is a tedious process, but most of the process takes is the time in leaching them. It, it sometimes it takes a week. Sometimes it may take two weeks. Cool. Um, all right. Next question: What do you do with madrone berries? Madrone berries are you could eat them wild like that, but again, most wild berries are full of seeds. So what you could do is um, create a, uh, a sauce. That's one way of being able to hold on to the berries in a form that you can use for the future. And when the berry goes out of season, which is around this time, you'll have sauce and you'll have a gosh gee whiz sauce. People saying, what is this sauce? Well, I forage for madrone berries. Madrone berries, what are those? So it starts a whole conversation. But with most berries, like I mentioned with the toyon berries, the madrone berries, you'd want to put them in a pan with very little water because you don't want to dilute it. 
and just put it on a very low heat and just let it ease, ease itself into a nice little sauce. And then when you've got enough liquid in there from the berries, then it's time to uh, uh, sift through that, put it through a colander and you got, you'll have your sauce, you'll have your, your juice, if you will, to, ready to make a sauce of any kind that you like and discard the seeds or save them and, and grow a tree. <laughs> okay, um, back to acorns. Someone is saying they have a lot of acorns from their own oak trees and they've tried a number of times to do the acorn flower lots and lots of soaking but it just wasn't working it keeps coming out really bitter um what did we do wrong these come from california live oaks uh that if they are yellow uh they will probably never leach i've tried that i've talked to a couple of other people that forage they say i i believe it's the coast live oak uh, that is the nut if they're yellow, if they're yellowish in color, they're never going to, uh, you didn't do anything wrong. In fact, I honor you for, for going as far as you did and trying to get something out of that. Kudos to you. Um, but they probably will not leach. So I would just discard those. The kind of acorns that you should get come from valley oaks, black oaks, white oaks. I think there's even a red oak. Um, almost any other kind of acorn except the the live oak if they're like i said if, if it's if it's a yellow meat it's not going to uh it's not going to leach okay um someone asked what was meant by saying the blackberries shown were created luther burbank um I, I don't want to say created, but he did, uh, he crossbred, uh, I'm not sure which berries, but I think partially uh, he, one part of it may have been the native blackberries, because native blackberries are kind of fussy, they're hard to grow, and so he took two different blackberries and put them together, I'm not sure what the other one would be. And he created the Himalayan blackberries. And as you can see, they're very, very invasive. They're everywhere. But man, you can't beat the taste of the berries. <laughs> In fact, I've got some grown here out on the farm that are just overcoming the fence. And I keep, uh, I keep shearing them back because they'll just keep growing. It's amazing how, uh, how resilient they are. Well, um, a couple of people have... Uh, provided a definition for brownfield, a former industrial or commercial site where future use is affected by real or perceived environmental contamination. So thank you very much to everyone who yeah, helped us out. That's, <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Uh, that was my intuition about what a brownfield was. I just pictured this field that was all dried out, that was of use to nobody. That's what I pictured a brownfield was, and that's what it turns out to be. A, a former field that uh, some in the industry was there. So that's that's uh, that's a good thing to know also. Um, let's see. Uh, someone said, what about nasturtium seeds? I, I did something with nasturtium seeds. Uh, I pickled them. Uh, and they have a little burst of flavor better than pickles. So if you want to take nasturtium seeds, I would take the fresh seeds and uh, while they're green, because this time of year, nasturtiums are, are uh, dropping a lot of seeds. And of course, they're like these little balls. Uh, I would take those when they're green. If you want to pickle them, try pickling them. And a pickling recipe is basically one part salt, one part sugar and some kind of flavoring if you want some kind of flavoring in there. And so brine them and uh pickle them that's basically and you can heat that up and then pour that into the uh in, into a jar with the seeds and you got pickled nasturtium seeds either that or you can let them dry out and you can plant those for the next season cool all right um someone says i grew up in idaho farm country and we would go to the canals and find asparagus 
It was simply delicious. Are there places you know of here in Contra Costa County where you can gather wild asparagus? Uh, I'm not from Costa, uh, Contra Costa County. Um, but yeah, there is, there are wild asparagus. In fact, that was the, the big thing with Yule Gibbons. Uh, I don't know if you remember who he is. He's actually one of the original foragers uh, about the wild asparagus. I'm not certain about their conditions in which they grow. So I would not be much help about wild asparagus. I have not come across any here where I live in Marin County, Sonoma County. Uh, I'm in Sonoma County now. I have not come across any yet. So I'm not sure of the kind of conditions that they need to grow in in order to start looking for them. Well, hope you find some. <laughs> that sounds good. All right. <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions about um, that are kind of similar. So there's people looking for in-person classes um, for foraging mushrooms. Do you have any recommendations for that or any resources? I would look, for yes, yes, of course. Uh, I would look uh, at SF Forage. Just put in SF Forage and they have uh, they have mushroom uh, trips all the time. They have seaweed trips. They have mushrooms. Mushrooms are like their biggest thing. And you can also look at the, uh, maybe is it the, the San Francisco Mycological Society, which is the mushrooming. You might want to uh, contact them to see if they have anything going on. But FSA, SF Forage always has mushroom classes. That's their big thing. So I would look them up on the internet. I'm actually one of their teachers. I've done uh, acorn acorn flower stuff with them, but look up SF Forage, and I'm sure you'll you'll find a class. And they go they go really fast. Most of them, almost all of them, sell out. So uh, if uh, if that may be the case, you can I'm sure that they can reference you for more people. You yeah, with mushrooming, you want to go out with somebody that is educated about mushrooms because it's a very complicated, very complex world out there with mushrooms. And there's a lot of lookalikes. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, is do you have any recommendations for an online app for identifying edibles? Uh, I've tried a couple. One didn't work out too well, but the one that I have now is iNaturalist. Uh, that seems to be a very good one. You know, and if you go to the store and uh, I, I'm talking about the app store uh, and you you put in iNaturalist, you'll probably get a couple of more apps also that are also very good for foraging and plant identification. What's good about iNaturalist is that they're all over the place and people are looking at the app all the time. And if you uh, take a picture, put in a question about what is this plant, you know, somebody's familiar with it, they will, they will get back to you on that. So it's a really open communication type of app. I would highly recommend it and use it a lot so, so that you know how to navigate it to your advantage. I actually can do more of that myself. So I still am I'm learning how to navigate it, but I natu I would recommend iNaturalist. Okay. Um, and very similar as well. Are there any foraging communities that you know of or other maybe groups, um, resources, anything like that that you recommend that we haven't already talked about? Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm I put together a, a foraging foraging session once or twice a year. Um, right now, it's uh, we're going into the into the fall, so there's not a lot. But like early spring is a good time to look around for that. I don't know of any offhand. I also do that, uh, but I only do one one or two a year. I'd like to do more, but it's, uh, I just need to get the word out a little bit more. So I gave you my information there and uh, uh, always feel free to contact me, jfbudo111 at gmail.com, or you can get a hold of me on Indigenous Edibles, my website, indigenousedibles.com. So feel free to get a hold of me for more information about what I do. But also, too, early spring is a wonderful time 
to get uh, foraging under there. There used to be a guy by the name of Kevin Feinstein who was in this area uh, who used to do what they call forage walks, nature walks. And it wouldn't be about foraging, but it would be about what is forageable. You know, you would, he would point out things and, you know, it would be for your own information so that you can go out on your own and do some foraging. But I would always recommend somebody that's knowledgeable if you have a little bit of a, um, if you're a, a little bit apprehensive about it. Great. All right. Um, someone says, any comments on carob tree pods? No, I'm not familiar with carob. I know it is a substitute for chocolate. Um, and I'm not even so sure that, that you'll find any around here. That's that's an interesting question. I don't know. Um uh, that's that one's you got me on that one. Uh I don't think that's a native tree that or any wild tree that grows around here. I don't know for sure, but I have never come across one in the area. Not that I know of. Okay. Um, has it been your personal experience or have you heard stories that eating local foods alleviate allergies? Local foods, it's not necessarily the local foods. What it is really is, first of all, buying organic. Uh, I would not buy conventional food if you have allergies. Depending on what kind of allergy it is, of course, but like gluten, which is a, a which is a pretty common, I, I guess you could consider it a, a, an allergy. Uh, with with wheat, conventional wheat, they are spraying it with glyphosate in order to dry it out. And I don't know if you know that or not, but most conventional foods have some kind of pesticide on them. So I would always, always, always buy organic. If you have, uh, but if you do have a gluten allergy, I would investigate the uh, ancient the ancient wheats like kamut, einkorn. Those are uh, structured uh, in a way that they cannot be hybridized, and the original wheat was not full of gluten. So if you were to find an ancient wheat like kamut. And uh, uh, I mentioned einkorn, and I think there's another one too that I, I I don't remember what it is. But look, but go after ancient grains, and you'll you'll come up with some that are probably may be good for people that have a gluten allergy because they are they cannot be hybridized, and our conventional wheat is hybridized to create more gluten protein, which is why there's probably a lot of allergies. I would suspect. I don't know for sure, but I, but my research uh, has has suggested that. So I would go to ancient. The older something is, the more original you can get it to its original form uh, when it first was propagated, when it was first domestic, or even when it was wild. If you can get it in a wild state, more than likely you you probably won't have to worry about allergies. Okay. Um, let's see, we've got a bunch of, um, tips in the question or in the Q and a section here from okay, other great. people just sharing info. Thank you all. That's really helpful. Someone says the Berkeley Botanical Gardens, um, they may have some resources as well as the Berkeley Herbal Center does yes. classes and herb walks. That would be great, especially, um, for some folks in Contra Costa. Good, good, then, uh, good suggestion. They have a good garden too. It's really nice. Beautiful. Full of natives. That's what I do. I work with the ingredients native to the Americas as a chef. And so I'm always looking for, for native uh, native plants. There's also some information from someone about uh, East Bay Regional Parks is doing um, at the Tilden Botanical Garden. Right. They're doing um, a plant identification type of walk. The information is in there. If anybody's curious, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yes, um, good. And then uh, we did have a question about... Um, the books that you recommended and uh -huh. if they could get that list. And I was just going to ask if you want to send me that photo, I can get that out to everybody. So you guys don't have to try to hunt those titles back down without. Yeah, let me, let me see if I can bring it up. 
Okay, no, that's not it. Well, oh, here it is. All right, let me bring it up, and then I will go to the last page, and you can take a picture. So let me do that. I'm not sure how to do this in a fast way, so <laughs> I'm going to do it this way. And we'll go to the page where the books are, and you can take a picture, and I can send this to Ava, and she can also help you with that. Come on, baby. There we go. There we are. Okay, there it is. So I would recommend taking a picture. Uh, it, it probably, that's what everybody seems to be doing now. Nobody hands out business cards only to have them photographed. So it's in my phone now. So um, you can take a picture of this. And like I said, I will send this to Ava. And if, and if you have any questions about that, or you can certainly always reach me. So these are all the books that are uh, very popular. And also, too, but these aren't guides. Now, when I mentioned earlier about going off foraging, you want to use a guide. Now, that's like a pocketbook that you could put in your pocket, a paperback. And, you know, that's considered a guide so that you can actually use it while you're out in the field foraging. Now, the one at the top there, uh, it's by David Aurora. It's called All That the Rain Promises and More. That's a book about mushrooms. That's probably the most famous mushroom book out there. That is a field guide. That's a paperback. It has colored pictures and it's it's a very fast reference. So uh, after you have a, these, some of these books may have paperbacks that you can use as a field guide to take with you when you actually go out there. That should be very helpful because you can identify what the pictures then. Uh, and actually, uh, the, at the bottom there, it says grow, forage, cook, and ferment. That's a website that I get a lot of information from. That's also a very good uh, website that you might want to look up. Her name is Colleen. I don't think she gives her last name. Uh, but if you look up Colleen, grow, forage, cook, and ferment, she has a, a website that's just full of information. She is, uh, she is Miss uh, Encyclopedia for cooking, for growing, for foraging, and fermenting. She uh, she has it all there. So this is a good, uh, this is where I got the picture from. So take a picture of this, and then I will send this to Ava. And so she has it, so you can get with her, or you can get with me. <laughs> let, me let me give you my information too. I'm at the bottom there. I'm also on LinkedIn. And these are some of the things that I do. You know, I, I love to do this. I love to teach people. Uh, so I will be very, uh, very helpful in, in doing what I can for you. If I don't know an answer, I will find out for you, you know. So there's my email, my website. And also you can check me out on LinkedIn if you wanted to do that. Great. That is awesome. Perfect place, I think, to wrap things up. Uh, we are made it through all the questions. So I think that's a great place to stop. Um, okay. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight and for your wonderful questions. Um, as a reminder, a recording of our presentation will be available on the Contra Costa County Library YouTube page. There's a link to that in the chat right now. Um, I'm also going to send a follow up email with all the contact information, um, the YouTube link, a link to John's website. Um, as well, so you can follow up with all of that via that email. Um, there's more information about upcoming Contra Costa County Library programs, including Outdoor Explorer programs, on our website, which is ccclib.org. Um, if you go to the events page, you can browse and search for things there. And we will continue to have more great Outdoor Explorer programs coming up for you. I think that's it. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much, Chef John. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you attending today and asking. It was great to hear all the questions. And just feel free to get in contact with me uh, anytime you want. Thank you so much.